All right, everybody, welcome to our workshop. Today we have Toby. Toby is the Hi. creator of Above Snakes. It's a game currently uh, uh, that you can currently wish list on Steam. He is a Unity developer. Um, he uh, he's going to be sharing with us uh, his history as a Unity developer, how he got to the point where he's building games uh, for a living. And uh, he's also going to dive into Above Snakes and kind of show us a little bit about uh, what's going on with that and, and how you can learn more about it. So, uh, Toby, thank you for being a part of this. Yeah, thank, um, thank you for, for inviting me here. <laughs> so, so, Toby, uh, give me an idea of, and we'll, we'll get to Above Snakes in just a little bit. Give me an idea of how you got into Unity development and game development general yeah sure um well myself i i studied uh computer science or i i started with economics and computer science and later switched into digital media with this which is like heaven heavily based on computer science a little bit of design and art and i just like had a regular job as a, as a web developer which i'm actually still uh doing part-time um as a like source of income and during my my job i um yeah i started developing on the side my first little projects in unity it was basically i was always like interested in the the map editors and campaign editors of games such as warcraft 3 and uh, age of empires and uh, yeah some others and at some point in time i thought hmm, maybe well that's I, I always felt like like limited by by these editors because you were only to do certain things but i wanted to do more and more and bigger and bigger and and i thought well, maybe it's time to dig into an actual game engine and uh, which was like at the start very overwhelming uh, like not not comparable to these editors at all and i think um yeah i started this as an as an evening project i would think as most of the projects start and um yeah i I think I spent the first two or three weeks just following Bracky's tutorials on YouTube. Um, back then he still made videos and um, I, I started with an, I think an RPG tutorial and I just like every line of code he, uh, he put there, I just copied, pasted and put it into my project. I, I have no idea what I was doing. And, uh, but that's, that's how you begin. That's how you begin to learn. And uh, later you understand what these lines do, of course. And um yeah, that's that's how I started my very first project. Uh, together later, a friend of mine joined then as an as an artist. I was never into three D modeling or art or music or that kind of stuff. I was always into like I had a programming career and I was more like a programming guy. So um, I always, yeah, searched for help in these areas. I, I would say, and um, yeah, that's basically how how it began back then. And uh, I think. I released my my first little project back then together with, with a friend of mine on itch.io after I would say a half year of development. Yeah. Like we yeah, we we, we spent half year of development only weekends and uh, on the evening in the evenings. And uh, yeah, we were able to release it of course for free. And um yeah, it was it was kind of yeah, I would say well received back back then. When, when I see it right now, I would say it was was a very like bad game, and uh, like that my 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 level of quality improved, of course, over the years. But but back then, that was, was the best I could achieve, and uh, I think it was fine. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we we got about um, oh yeah, or, or we we got about two thousand downloads, I think, on HIO, which is which is pretty good, I would say, for for this game. We were like for for a day or two on the um, on the hot on the hot page. Um, that was because we started a Twitter channel, the Twitter channel I'm still using actually, um, in on which we almost daily just blocked our progress uh, just into the into the internet, and well, people began to follow, and um, yeah, we're interested, and um, yeah, so I would say that's that's very important to like start very early on, like even maybe day one early on to say, hey, I'm just following a tutorial and doing this and that, and. You get a lot of feedback, especially on Twitter. Like there are really people caring about what you do in your games, and um, that was pretty cool. And yeah, our first project was called Yeah Lonesome. Actually, it was years later that was the basis of Above Snakes. Actually, mm -hmm. uh, but I can come to that like later. Um, but yeah, 
that's that's how I got into game development, I would say. And from from then on, I went on with with projects. And uh, back then, we we had uh, we were discovered by um, by publishers, and publishers came to us and uh, offered us deals. Actually, after after the, the release of this free game, and they said, "Hey, if you can turn it into a commercial game and uh, do this and that." But um, we declined back then because, uh, yeah, it felt more like I was a half a year into this career and it felt like too much of a jump into cold water to, to go like with a developer, with a publisher and almost doing it full time. And uh, with that commitment, it didn't feel safe enough back then. So I stick to my, to my day job and um, said, okay, no, I, I'm not doing this year. And um, I think it was the, was a good choice because then for, I think two years or so, I just developed smaller games and just put them out there just to get some some experience. So I, I basically scrapped that that first project and said, okay, that was fine, went well. Did a couple of smaller projects which didn't go so well as the first one. Um, but yeah, and then came a point in time when I decided, okay, I'm doing this now for I think three three and a half years, and it is something I'm still enjoying a lot. And um, I want to do this as a living actually. And then I started to do, to treat it more seriously and not as an evening project, but yeah, well, it was still in the beginning, but with more commitment and more of the idea of how can I actually generate at some point money out of this so I can live from this as a career. And um, yeah, then um, I, I tried also like another yeah, some 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 smaller projects and after like every month or two I released them just to see how well they're received and then I came back to my very first project Lonesome and created a second demo for that one and that one went again really well so I thought okay this is something this Wild West setting something people really want to see in this genre actually and um yeah, then I decided, okay, this is the one I want to focus on right now because it was all of my projects, this one went, went the best. So um, yeah, I focused on that one and um, I still worked almost full-time and developed this as a, I think, second or third demo in that, uh, for, the, for that game already and put it out or, uh, again and was again well-received. And then um, I talked again with publishers and this time I thought then, okay, yeah, now I'm, I'm signing a deal with the publisher and then I'm going almost full-time commitment into this and um, yeah, want to turn it into game. And then Above Space was born as uh, like, as uh, we, we renamed the project and did some marketing and said, okay, um, yeah, just to have like, like a cut and to say, okay, this is now the, the actual project we're working on, forget all the demos in the past. And this is Above Snakes and we start from here. And this is, yeah, but, but, but if we are, if we're honest, it's it's like a renaming of Lonesome. We we used the code base from back then and uh, went on further. Um. So <laughs> you brought up something, publishers. Okay. So talk to us about your experience dealing with publishers. Like, what is? Did you reach out to them? They reached out to you. It sounds like a little bit of both. But also, um, you know, how do you guys work together? Yeah. Um, I, I was always in the in the lucky position that I never reached out to publishers. They always reached out to me. Um, but I think that is because I always blocked like my whole game development life on my Twitter account. And I always uh, try I, I try to keep posting like almost daily or every second day just to 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 let people know, hey, I'm still doing this, I'm still making progress. And um, well, you, you generate reach through that, of course. And um, yeah, the, the publishers, they recognize that. And then they see, oh, okay, this guy is really, it's not like, he's not like doing this for, for a month or two, he's doing this for years. So he's serious about his stuff. And um, then they reach out to you. And um, yeah, I, I think I, I didn't really receive a lot of message, but I think in my whole career, maybe six or seven publishers, some, 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 something about it around that. And they, they reach out to me and I had, I think, talks with uh, maybe three or four of them mm -hmm. and um yeah how, how how do we work um so yeah i signed with Creativo games um i signed with them in i think april this year when we uh decided on developing above snakes as a commercial game and um yeah how do we work together it it really depends it depends on on which state state of the of game we are of the game we are basically we have a 
we have a contract in which um, we, we stated, I'm responsible for the product, I'm responsible for uh, delivering, I'm responsible for the design decisions. They're responsible for marketing and distribution. That's basically how, how, it, how it goes. And uh, then you agree on a share. And um, it is uh, usually, oh no, it, it, it is, um, I am, even though I am responsible of the decisions, I always have meetings with them and let them and show them what I'm working on, what is the current state of the game, um, and also get a lot of feedback by them because they have obviously a lot more experience in selling games than, than I have. And they oftentimes say, hey, this is really cool. We have seen similar in this or that game that, that went really well and they added this or that. Can you also do this feature or do it like, like they did or maybe a little bit different? And so, so they, they bring in a lot of ideas, a lot of really good ideas, I think. And um, yeah, so we, we usually, we have meetings every, every other week uh, where we just talk about what's going on right now, what I'm into right now, what, what they are doing right now. Like if they, uh, if they are planning something like a, like a conference, like, a, I don't know, like a talk, or if they're planning uh, or what, what we did in June, the, uh, the, the Steam Summer Festival, that was also their idea. Uh, which I can highly recommend, by the way, uh, what's, what's really, really great, like marketing and feedback tool. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, de depending on if we're right now in a state of like right before a major announcement, such as trailer, such as a Kickstarter campaign, such as a Kickstarter trailer, such as a new demo, that kind of stuff. And then we're working a lot more together than we probably meet yeah, a couple of times a week um, because we are just, just discussing about art, about music, about uh, yeah, what we show in the trailer, what we don't show. Mm -hmm. um, and if we're just like in like right now, just in the making progress uh, process, just yeah. developing, then um, yeah, we are we're not meeting. Uh, we're just meeting every other week. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. So. Since we're we're talking about above us, let's 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 bring it out and, and let's let's talk about this real quick. I'm going to show a quick trailer of the game so everyone has sure. an idea. It was a mild summer night when the sky began to rain fire. They tried to bury the ones they lost. What have they done to deserve this fate? stay above snakes. Very beautiful. So one of the things that um, I noticed right away is you are using a, um, a technique that people do with regular cameras mm -hmm. where they want to make large environments look small. So they end up <laughs> yeah. uh, shooting it on a, like a, like a very parallax camera and they blur the tops and the bottoms. So yes. cities look like miniatures as they're, they're yes. is it, is, was that intentional? Was that something that you were yeah. like, yeah, I want to hit that. Yeah, yeah, more more like intentional. <laughs> um, yeah, this this yeah, you 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 explain it perfectly. Basically, you have an isometric camera, mm -hmm. and uh, you try to position it uh, far away from things, and of course with the possibility to to zoom in. But the default setting would be like more far away that everything looks small, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, then you blur top and bottom. And you get this effect and then, yeah, everything looks a little smaller. It looks like you have it like, yeah, in your room, maybe uh, on, a, on a table or, or something. And I did this because I think it supports 
this feeling of this tiled world very well. And uh, I think uh, th this, this world can't be really immersive. You're not like in first person, you're not like, uh, like in a real world that consists of real landscape. This is a world that you craft yourself with these tiles. So there's no point in making this feel immersive. The, the, the point here is to, making, to make it feel like a, a playful tool or that you want to, yeah, that you want to play with. So it, it feels like it's, it's a toy maybe. And um, yeah, that's why, why I choose these, these aesthetics for the game. So, so tell me, like, give me the idea of the story here, because I'm, I'm also interested how you managed to tie in a story with tile systems of your environment. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's not really a story behind the, the tiles. I, I, I use these tiles more as a game mechanic, as a gameplay element. The story is basically um, there's an outbreak uh, of this plague in the, in the country and um, people are dying and then after they die, they turn into living dead. And it's kind of your job to... Uh, to yeah to to find out the reasons behind this why is this happening because there's a very specific reason and um yeah which which sites are involved and um yeah there are some secrets that you want to discover and um so i am using this explore mechanic where you don't know how the map looks like mm -hmm. um because you basically generated yourself um to be able to to explore stuff in the world and to be able to find stuff yourself and yeah, that's that's basically how how I do it. And as far as I know, it's just you working on this, correct? Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm a solo developer, and um, yeah, as I said, I, I'm more of a programming guy. So uh, I'm focusing on the on the programming part, on the engine, on uh, yeah, of course, game design decisions and implementing the systems and deciding on the systems and that kind of stuff. Um, but for for art, the, like the the trailer art you've you've seen in the trailer, like these, these parallax effects, the voiceover, the music, I, I didn't do any of these. These are stuff I just I worked together with people, collaborated with them, and um, yeah, they they did this stuff uh, for me. But yeah, I'm I'm the product owner, the project owner, and this is yeah my solo game as you as you as you want to, and. Um, yeah, and of course, I'm, I'm working together. Like the biggest part would be the publisher. I'm working together with. Very cool, very cool, and uh, of course, we have Toby and his his Twitter account right here, which you know documents basically every cool new system that he implements. And and you're right, like every couple of days, you're posting a brand new video showing a brand new mechanic of how something is going to work inside your world. Yeah, or some, sometimes it's just updating an existing mechanic, showing that I fixed some bugs, that I improved it in, in some way. And yeah, re recently I did a lot with the base building um, because that, you didn't see that in the trailer at all. That's because the trailer was made in uh, April or May, I think, um, when this wasn't implemented yet. But the idea is you have like, this is a survival game and uh, maybe survival RPGs if you, if you want to. Um, and the idea is you start on a tile, like the first one is for free uh, and you can make this your own. Like the first tile, you can build your, your cabin on, um, you can have furniture in your cabin. You have basically shelter in, in the, on this first tile. So you can always come back to that and yeah, get resources from that. Mm -hmm. And from that tile, you can discover the world like in any direction you want to. And the cool thing is that the world, every time you start the game, is randomly generated with a seed. So there are parts of the world that are maybe colder, like snowy areas. There are parts with lakes, there are parts with swamp, there are deserts and uh, forests, and you get the idea. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, you, when, you see, when you look on the map, when you start the game, you see, oh, okay, if I go north, there's maybe snow. When I go west, there's desert. And then you can make an intentional decision and say, okay, um, for this run, for this journey, I want to go into the desert first because I see there's a quest waiting for me there. So I'm going into that direction. And on that direction, you can then, for each tile that you want to go in that direction, choose how it should look like exactly like 
um, do, uh, for instance, if it's if it's a snowy tile, you can choose from is this maybe a frozen lake or is this a snowy forest or is this uh, maybe a tundra or something else. So you get offered these different options for each tile, and they also have stats assigned to them, like how uh, how good they are for getting crafting resources, how good they are for food and water resources, and uh, how dangerous they are if there are. Uh, if you if you should expect zombies there, for instance, and then you can make a decision. Okay, I'm going here high risk reward, or I'm going the safe tile, or I need a very specific resource right now, so I need to spawn this tile. Uh, yeah, just because I'm otherwise I'm starving or I'm dying from thirst, and um, yeah, that's that's how it works basically. And so this game is a is a, is designed as a roguelite. So when you die, you're dead, and your items are gone. But everything you created on your first tile, like on your main base, that stays. So you can improve over the course of the game or over the course of the runs. Um, yeah, by improving your base, by adding furniture, by adding maybe a garden where you can farm crops, which are useful in the future then. Or maybe by adding a bed that you can all the time use to get some rest if you need it, if you want to come back. Uh, by adding an oven to get, uh, to, to, to get the ability to cook stuff. And uh, also, yeah, to have like a tool rack where, where some of your tools will stay permanently that you can re reuse the next run so you don't need to recraft your axe every time. Right. Um, yeah, so, so this is basically how, how it works. You must have a billion systems, billion managers <laughs> on all simultaneously. <laughs> I mean, we've got a crafting manager, like a, like a, there's mm -hmm. a, there's a, there's of course, you know, your, your player health system, but you got like a, like a, a food system, it sounds like. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so there's a crafting system for that. There's base development. There's a tile yeah. generation. Not only that, the tiles change based on if you're going north, south, east, or west. So it changes via climate. Like, how complicated is your back end on this? How many managers do you have going all simultaneously to, to pull something off? Um, how did you do that? Because it sounds like a monumental feat. Yeah, um, I think yeah, I, I, I'm use I, I'm using managers and I'm using uh, singleton patterns mm -hmm. uh, like a lot, mm, and I think managers there would be probably around twenty or so, but I I try to to design it in a way that, well, you always have like a single responsible to to a single manager to a single script to a single class. So um, I, I try to separate it in a way that I still know what is doing what. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, then that way I think it's, it's still manageable. And um, I think you just need to make like the right cuts in your code, if that makes sense. Like mm -hmm. not to have like this super mutant manager that does everything and <laughs> no, <laughs> you need to keep yeah. it small. <laughs> or at, at least all. try to, yeah. Wow, this is incredible. Um, I, I had no idea how deep and how incredibly complex and, and how every single time you play, you can basically have a different experience if you choose to. Yeah, that's that's the idea. And um, uh, like the, the, the quest progress is permanent. So uh, if you if you completed a quest, um, you won't see that quest again. Mm -hmm. So the idea is every time you play, you, you make some progress. And with that progress, that being saved, you can dig through the story like bit after bit, like run after run. And maybe some runs you complete one or two quests and then you get further in the story. Some other runs you don't complete any quests, but you still, oh yeah, there's still there's a meta currency. So you're still being able to get something from the meta currency and you can use that to improve your equipment, to improve your base. So the next one will be better than in the future. And um, yeah, so so you still have the feeling of okay, I'm achieving something here, but the game is, I think, difficult enough um, that you will need like more than one run just to complete everything to see everything. Absolutely, absolutely. And also, like every time, stuff is of course placed differently. And let, let's say in the one run, like the deserty region is right next to where you start. The next run, it could be ten tiles away, and then you need to travel like a long way until you're there. And um, oh yeah, I forgot to mention that the further you go away from your starting point, the harder it gets. So mm -hmm. the harsher the environment gets, the more enemies there are, the more dangerous there are. So you try to like, first explore the stuff around you, but sometimes 
you maybe want to go further away because you see, okay, there is something because I market it on the map. I pre-generate that too. I market, okay, here is somebody waiting for you. He has something for you. And then you want to go there and um, yeah, try your best. Oh, wow. That, that's incredible. Um, I know we spoke before and uh, hopefully you're going to take us to show us something pretty interesting that you developed. Um, so if you would like, uh, I'm going to set you up as co-host and you can be able to share your screen. And uh, I'd love to you, for you to show us something that uh, is, is pretty phenomenal that you, uh, you use. Yeah, let me just move some windows around here. And I am just, I think it's enough if I just show Unity. <clears throat> so can, can you see my, my Unity screen here? Yes, yes. Perfect, okay. Re regarding your question here, these are the, these are the managers. Oh, there you go. On the, on the right side, yeah. I, I, I usually, I, I always assign them like to one game object. So I always have an overview if I, like for instance, need to, uh, look something up in uh, I don't know maybe here the tutorial manager and then I see ah oh, okay this is tutorial manager these are the tutorial steps here and um, yeah that's how I organize stuff basically um, it's actually pretty yeah, but, instead of creating multiple game objects for different managers yeah yeah um, yeah may maybe it's best if we just go like for maybe five minutes into the game. So it makes sense what we're talking about. Um, so yeah, as I said, you you start basically on, on one tile here and it looks a little bit different than the trailer. That's because, well, the trailer's a couple of months old. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so what, what you can do in this world here, you just move around of course, but you can also uh, like, yeah, get resources such as here yeah, these, these small bushes here, these are berry bushes. So I can just hit them here and then I get berries. And these berries, they, for instance, can be used, I have them in my inventory here then. I can use them then uh, to satisfy my hunger and a little bit of my thirst. And I can also use them later on then to cook some kind of stuff, but I'm missing ingredients here. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe we can, we can start uh, building some tools, I will, just hit that tree here. As you can see, I'm not dealing any damage here. But what I'm trying is that the tree will give me some of his twigs there, one is falling. Um, oh, there's a pine cone, another twig, there's another twig. So we have three twigs. We can go into the crafting menu. And these are right now the crafting options. There's not a lot of content yet, but um, there will be for sure. And yeah, I can craft an axe here, which I will do. Then I get it into my inventory and I assign them to a hotkey. And now I can use the axe to, um, yeah, to chop the tree here. And of course, also to chop the bush. Now the tree is falling and I get some logs here from this tree. And then I can go further and with those logs, I can create a pickaxe, for instance. And with this pickaxe, I will assign it to hotkey. I can, uh, yeah, harvest some rocks here. Mm -hmm. And I can also try to use my axe to, to harvest this rock, but this will take ages. Mm -hmm. I deal one or two damage. <laughs> so I need to use the pickaxe to do this. And then I get some rocks. Oh, yeah, I also got a flint out of this rock. Flints are used for making fire. Um, it's also very handy. And uh, when I have the, the feeling to go further, I can go to a tile edge, and then I see this little animation here. And uh, actually, I don't have enough resource and still some, some locks. Let me just get some, some more locks here. And um, yeah, when we go to a tile edge, we can explore world, as it says. Mm -hmm. If you hit that button, um, ignore the icons. The icons are still always the same. Then we get offered different kind of tiles here. For example, here we have two pine forests and a farmland that we can use. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have different stats here, like different uh, water sources, food, loot, crafting resources, and danger. 
And uh, for instance, this right one here has like a lot of crafting resources, so we can expect a lot of trees and rocks and uh, other materials there, maybe even some, some metals if we're lucky. And um, actually this one is, in, I think in every category better than, than the left one. Or we can say we need a farmland and then we uh, get, some, get some crops, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, let me just go back here before I spawn this. You can get an overview of which tiles you can spawn by using the map. This is the map. So and I see um, like around me, these are green spots. So this is very like medium uh, climate. So, so I would expect forests and grasslands here and yeah, farmlands maybe. But when I see here, like here, there are more like these brown spots, these brown ones will be more dry and more deserty. So I can maybe expect some, some mild deserts here. And right here on the left here, here's a, here's a little bit like a mountain belt. And after this mountain belt, there is a lot of snow. So this, all, everything here left is, is snowy. So this is the information that we got from the map here. And um, yeah, and this, this is every time different, of course. And oh yeah, what we also saw is that in this direction, here's the NPC waiting for us. So yeah. maybe he will have a quest or something cool for us. And um, yeah, so uh, again, uh, let's get back to this one and spawn. Uh, what should I spawn? Farmland or or pine forest? Uh, let's let's see. Let's do some farmland. Farmland, farmland it is. And here it comes. And then yeah, as you can see, the world is then um, yeah coming together. And uh, yeah, as we see here, the farmland here some you know, here's some some crops. Uh, no, it's 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 wheat actually that we can harvest here. Oh, because it was a desert environment, it looks like that. Yeah, it was a little bit more dry than. Uh, yeah, oh, here's a barrel that we can that we can uh, destroy. Oh, it's some leather. It's fine. Yeah, and here's a well. In case we have, if if we would have a bottle, we would be able to get some water from this well here. Uh, but we don't have have it yet. This little one here. Oh yeah, some hemp. And. Um, yeah, that's basically how the the basic game loop works and uh, yeah. medicine also very useful if we go further here uh maybe let's do a forest here then we should probably encounter enemies uh, we're not far enough let's see if i can see some enemies graveyard should be should be filled with zombies or not <laughs> Yeah, so some of them only only spawn like like they always spawn uh, just uh, like randomly. Uh -huh, uh -huh. If we search some of these graves, sometimes uh, these graves are filled with zombies. <laughs> let's, let's search them. And as you can see, my needs on the left here are decreasing. Like when I'm searching these graves, I'm actually using uh, losing sanity. Uh -huh. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm also getting like bones and pebbles and stuff here. Uh -huh. And yeah, that's basically how it works. Like you, you can explore the world. You can, yeah, you can get some stuff. Let's search this coffin here. Some more bones. Destroy this crate. But there are no enemies here. But yeah, I, I just decreased the spawn chance. Maybe it's too low uh, right now. But yeah, it doesn't matter. So when you create these tiles, are they pre-made? prefabs of an array that you're just like random ranging between dependent yeah um location? yeah it, it it works like like that um like these are tile cards like for instance canyon here T canyon is a tile card and every tile card has um, a tile card is a scriptural object and there are some prefabs assigned um that are the actual tiles so mm -hmm. there's an option of i think right now it's one two three different tiles mm -hmm. And um, I can I can actually show that. Um, let's go to the tiles here. Like for instance, the uh, which one did we see? The farm here. We see we've seen the farm. Oh, I can't do this in play mode. Oh boo! Oh boo! Okay, that doesn't matter. We stop the play mode. So the farm here. Um, this is how it looks like. Um, this is the prefab of of course. Uh -huh. And um, there are, uh, there could be, there, there are not yet, but there could be different variations of this one. So I could just create two, 
uh, nested prefabs, for instance, and um, I would all assign them to the to the card, and the card would then just randomly choose one of these tiles. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I also do is I have like one container here with all the environment on the uh, on the tile. And what I do is every time you spawn it, I will just randomly decide by 90 degrees uh, which direction it will spawn on the tile. So every time it will look a little bit different. So you don't have the idea of this copy pasted uh, world. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there are different tiles and the contents of the tiles are rotated randomly. So uh, then your, your world doesn't look like copy pasted. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, very yeah, that, that, that's how, how this works. Very cool. Yeah, and another thing that I wanted to show just very quickly, as I said, like on your main base, you are on your main uh, tile, you are able to to build a little base um, that will also stay. As you can see, the axe and the pickaxe also stayed because they are like this, this bluish color and everything that's bluish will stay over the runs. Everything that's white will disappear. You will, you will lose everything that's white when you die and you will keep everything that's blue when you, uh, yeah, when you restart the game. Gotcha. And uh, I just activated like a little cheat mode so I can just craft things without paying for it. And uh, let me just craft a workbench here, just save some time. As you can see, I can place this here somewhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I placed it here and then I can use this workbench to actually increase my, uh, my cabin tier or my building tier. And I can buy different building parts. So for instance, I could maybe get some foundations here, maybe a couple of windows and a door and maybe a table. We can then put it, oh yeah, the roof, of course. Now, is this inventory system, did you custom create this specifically? I, yeah, I created everything, everything from, from scratch. Um, just because I'm, I'm so bad at uh, maintaining stuff other people create and uh, <laughs> then I just created myself. Yeah, I hear you. And uh, so also the crafting system, like the actual development building of your, let's say, cabin or, or wall. So you develop that yourself as well to where it's like, all right, I'm going to lay down tiles. I'm going to put my mouse next to the tile. How does that work? Is there like a, a, a collider on all four sides that detect if like this one? Crafting? Yes. Uh, yeah, let me, yeah, there, there's a little collider in the middle here. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the sake of performance, the player is checking if any colliders near the player. Like if you would check from the collider from the tile, then you would get a lot of checks like increase by like by increasing world size. Mm -hmm. So it's better to check from the player uh, if he's near uh, any edge. So did you did you create like triggers? Let's say you have your floor that you're going to create like your wooden floor palette. You have triggers yeah. on all four sides to determine if a wall can fit there and how it should fit appropriately. D did you set it up like that? Like, how did you, you're building the, the, the building system here? Yeah. 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 Like, like the, the, the first, um, the first platform here, the first foundation, I can just place freely, of course. Mm -hmm. And um, then I have, yeah, little, little trigger colliders here. Okay. And these trigger colliders, my platform that I can move here will snap to this collider when I come close. Gotcha. So I can just, yeah, so I can just place it like this. Okay. And um, yeah, so this every every of these foundations has like a little four, four of four, four trigger colliders at the sides. Gotcha. And the same, same then with walls, like I can move around the wall here, I can rotate it if I want to, but if I get near these colliders, then it will snap and then nice. I can place it here. Oh, that's amazing. That's really so. clever. So I can just snap them here around and I can very quickly build. I just need more walls, but. Uh... Mm -hmm. um, one of our students, Tom, had a question. Are yeah. like the enemies self-contained inside each tile or can they actually go into other tiles? Uh, they can go into other tiles. Um, I, I'm using a NAV, NAV mesh agent mm -hmm. for the enemy movement. Yeah. And what I did is I have actually, uh, I, I can't stop the play mode here because uh, the zoom button is in front of it. <laughs> okay, uh, well, what I did is I have like a very huge ground. Uh, let me find it. Um, 
Where do I have it? Oh, it's it's oh it's here, of course. So I have a very uh here. This is the ground for NPCs. That's how how it calls. You oh. you can't see it actually. Uh, so if we go to the player, maybe this is how it looks like. So if I make it visible, the ground for NPCs, uh, render on, this uh, is this one. This is where the enemies can walk on. Okay. And so they can walk everywhere. Right. And even also where where there's no tile. Right. But you need to pre-calculate this, of course, and you don't know how the world looks like. So what I'm doing is every tile edge, like every end of the tile, gets enough mesh obstacle. Oh. So they can't cross the borders because they're obstacles. And um, every time I spawn a tile next to another tile, I will just destroy the, the walls, the invisible walls, which are the obstacles, so the Nefmesh agents can go across them. Oh, that's, that's how it works. Very clever. Uh, here the tile. Uh, yeah, this year, for example, this is a, this is a tile, tile doc. I call them tile doc. Maybe it does have a mesh renderer. Yeah. Yeah, but the render is, isn't so big as the collider. So the collider is a little bit bigger as, as, the, render, as the render, of course. Mm -hmm. So this is the the, uh, the tile dock. And as you can see, it has a collider. And the collider has enough mesh obstacle to prevent enemies to cross them. And has a box collider to prevent the player, of course, to fall from the edges. And uh, in the middle... I have uh, like a little bit, like a little detection, like this this little hitbox in the middle. This is made for the player to detect if there's an edge, if I can spawn another tile here. And of course, these particles, these are children that are then uh, shown. Oh, I can't show them here in pause. Okay. Uh, yeah, when, when I have the uh, possibility to, to spawn new tiles here. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and when I spawn a tile next to this tile, then this one is used and also the collider, the the tile dock of the next tile is also then not available because yeah it's always like here's already a tile placed so i will destroy both of them they have like a little collision check i think it's a trigger enter check or a collider enter check and then if they if they notice another tile they will destroy themselves oh that's so clever yeah. very smart very smart um okay so so toby um Let's see if you guys have any questions, go ahead and ask uh, Toby. Uh, this has been phenomenal. Can you tell us a little bit more about above snakes? When, what are you able to tell us about it? Release wise, what we can expect, uh, you know, d don't violate any NDAs here. Uh, yeah, but, yeah, of course. Uh, you um, know, tell us, give us an idea of what we can expect. Sure. Yeah, okay. So yeah, game is obviously still in development, as you can see. Um, you can already play it basically, but or I can already play it. You you can't, unfortunately. Um, but um I started this project in January this year, and I uh, teamed up with Kratifu in April and uh, or late March, April, and we then worked on an announcement trailer, and after that worked very hard on a first demo for the Steam Festival, which was in, in June, the mid of June, which was a big success for this game. Um, and we got a lot of very valuable feedback and we wanted to put it into the game uh, before uh, making any other major step. So I'm right now still in this phase where I'm working on stuff that people want to have in the game um, that they mentioned during the festival. And uh, I am right now, aiming for a Kickstarter campaign is starting in January next year. So right after Christmas, um, probably February, but, but let's say January. And um, during the Kickstarter campaign, it will, or I hope so, I hope that it will be possible to play another demo of the game at a much more developed state, of course. So people backing the game will uh, have an idea of how the game looks and feels like before they back anything. And um, my idea is to, um, to, to have the alpha, um, the alpha version of the game uh, as, an, as a reward for the Kickstarter backers. So right after the Kickstarter campaign, let's say maybe in February then, uh, I want to give out the alpha to everyone who backed the game so they can play it instantly after the campaign is done. Okay. And that would be awesome for me too, because then I would have my funding to be able to complete the whole game 
and um, yeah, and the people can already play what they what they paid for basically. Mm-hmm. And then I would say we would probably go early access, maybe depending on how much they're still to do, maybe a half year or three quarters of a year after that. So maybe fall or winter next year to be very uh, yeah, to do not not to to promise anything here that I can't hold, but Absolutely. it's probably maybe it's maybe it's already summer next year, but let let's say fall or, or winter. Okay, and yeah, then it would be available for everybody, and um, yeah, that's that's basically the the plan for the game right now. Okay, um, yeah, let's see. Uh, Tom asked, "Will there be any pets?" Um, right now there are no pets, um, but this is something I'm definitely thinking about. And that could be something that I would maybe add to the Kickstarter stretch goals. Like depending on if people people really want to have that, then I would probably add that. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is something that would cost a lot of development time, of course. So yeah, probably a stretch goal. Can Can you tell me a little bit about your experience with the Steam Summer event that you you you, you spoken of? What was it like? Sure. Um, it's really interesting, actually. It's really interesting. Um, so if, if you are right now in the development of a bigger project, let, let's say a project that runs longer than a year, and you are at the point where you could put out a demo that people could enjoy, then I would highly recommend uh, participating in one of these festivals, like either in the summer or in the fall, maybe. And you can only pers- participate at one festival per year, by the way. And uh, your game need to have a release date, I think, about a year in advance to the festival. So these are the, the conditions. And what you do is then, yeah, you put your put your demo on Steam and um, you can increase your chances to, to be seen by, by streaming your, your own game or to, to ask people to stream your game. Then it will be featured on stream uh, on, on Steam. And um, yeah, for, for Above Snakes, it was a very good festival uh, because there were a couple of big streamers and big YouTubers that picked up the game without even us asking them to. And uh, so we we had, for example, a Raptor, which, which has like, I think, one million subscribers. He picked up the game, made half an hour video about it, which was a big boost for, yeah, for the wishes, of course. <clears throat> and also yeah, a couple of others and a couple of smaller ones too. And as I said, a lot of people uh, joined the Above Snakes Discord and uh, added their feedback and said, "Hey, I just played the game, and uh, I encountered this or that, and I wanted to have it like this or that. And I have a suggestion here, and which was really awesome." Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, I can I can really uh, recommend these festivals, and um, yeah, I, th- I think for for Above Snakes, we in, in that festival week, I think it generated about. 4k wish list just alone in this festival mm-hmm. and uh which is which is pretty pretty great of course for for just one week um Incredible. and yeah maybe a little more maybe 5k i, I don't know but it doesn't matter but yeah it was it was, it was a very very successful, successful festival for for this game and another question is is um all right so the people in this chat they are applying for positions as game developers uh, they are also considering making their own games on the side while they're waiting for those positions to come about. What tips, suggestions do you have for people so that they don't start a game and then it disappears after like a week? Like they, they just, they, you know, it's, it's one of those projects they begin and then it just it turns into a time sink. Yeah, yeah, of course. I, I would say, like at the beginning, keep your scope low, but um, try to keep it as open that you can things can add things later on. Um, this like also the same as with above snakes. Like I started very, 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 uh, very small. Not slow, small, of course, very small. And um, then I keep kept adding like features and features and features. <clears throat> so I think it's good to have like at any time. To have like a playable game and uh, try try to maintain that goal to have at any time an enjoyable and playable game, and then add stuff later on, and um, yeah, especially for small teams and first projects and solo teams, I would keep the the scope low, uh, low let's, let's go yeah scope scope low and uh, yeah yeah rather put something out that's well polished than something bigger that's not not polished. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Um, all right, guys, uh, if you do get the opportunity, I would recommend uh, wish listing this, uh, adding it onto your wish list so you can uh, support Toby and also be able to check him out on his Twitter account. Um, we have the link right here in chat. Um, any other ways that people can uh, keep track of what's going on with you, Toby? Uh, I, I think the Discord is always uh, a good place to be if you want to participate, like in um, in the progress and the process, and in uh, yeah, giving feedback to the game. That uh, always helps. Um, and yeah, of of course, also uh, on on the Buff Snakes Discord, you can you can also find me, and you can anytime DM me, and if you have like any specific questions regarding the game or regarding unity or regarding maybe you see something in my game that you also wanted to make and maybe i have an opinion on how to do that or how i achieve that maybe it helps you to to find an opinion how to how to do it yourself and um yeah i'm, I'm always open for for conversations and uh, i like to connect with people and uh, so never never think that i'm too busy to to reply or something just Drop me a message and uh, I will reply to everyone. Definitely. Perfect. Any last words, Toby, before uh, we leave everybody? Well, thank you again for, for having me here. It was really great. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to to showcase like my career path and my my project. And um, yeah, it was really great. A lot of fun here.